I'm going to keep my introduction short. Those of you who saw the flyer got to read a few paragraphs about a very unusual Renaissance man named Ed Bilski. And the reason he's unusual is that he's had remarkable success in very different disciplines. I first met Ed 20 years ago because of a shared interest in synthesis and development of novel molecules. And Ed has had a very distinguished career in building up a very strong neuroscience program, in securing very prestigious large NIH grants for neuroscience, and actually in even having a spin-off company or two. So he has excelled at that. But what's unusual and interesting about Ed is that he's open to a lot of different ideas and disciplines and has been instrumental in doing something very special at the University of New England. And he will talk to us about that. He's held uh, annual days of an interprofessional arts nature about pain, trying to understand it from multiple dimensions. He's conducted community outreach and been recognized for this and invited to the White House. So Ed is going to speak on a theme that we've had several others speak about, namely interprofessional education and interprofessional experience. I think that this is absolutely a direction in which pain education is going. And I was delighted to see that among the audience, the, the ones who got here early, are some of our own graduates from fields like occupational therapy, pharmacy, nursing. So we love it. We love what Ed's doing. We salute what Ed is doing. And we look forward to having his talk and archiving it so we can direct others to it. So without further ado, let's welcome Ed and thank, thank him you. for coming down here. Uh, I want to thank Dan for inviting me. It's uh, been about 11 years since I was down at Tufts previously. I was in the Department of Pharmacology giving a seminar. And I got to reconnect with Dan there. And I'm going to highlight some of the other connections that we've had over the last uh, decade or so. And it's had an enormous influence on the growth of the University of New England and our research program. Uh, so for some shopkeeping first. Uh, Dan asked me to do several things and not do some other things. So I wanted to go over those with, with everybody. Uh, the first thing was explain the title. I'm a Grateful Dead fan. And Lighting the Song with Sense and Color is a lyric from uh, Terrapin Station. And it has relevancy, though, I think, to neuroscience and to this presentation. Uh, this is Mickey Hart's brain, or at least an uh, a, uh, embellishment of that on his brain patterns. Mickey Hart is the drummer for the Grateful Dead, one of the drummers. And he uh, started working with a neuroscientist in California to look at what goes on when he's performing. And so they're trying to do a collaborative to kind of understand uh, music and language. And this gets connected to something that just hit the news wires last week, which was the influence of jazz musicians being able to play off of each other and basically convincing themselves with fMRI that there's some very unique or you know, similarities between uh, jazz musicians and language. Uh, so it's a form of communication. And I think that's very relevant to a pain population where you're working with uh, you know, people who have a serious uh, you know, health condition and might be compromised because of the chronic pain in terms of uh, being able to effectively communicate with healthcare providers and vice versa. The healthcare professionals usually are undertrained to having to communicate with these uh, people who suffer from chronic pain. So the things I'm not going to do are going to give a lot of statistics that you already know about. We are convinced that chronic pain is a debilitating condition that affects many, many people. I'm not going to show lots of data slides in pharmacology. It would bore you all to death. And uh, I already did that 11 years ago when I was down here. Dan didn't want me to show this one. I'm going to just show it briefly because I think it does bring up an important point in that it can feel overwhelming to anybody involved in the pain field uh, about th this crisis that we're having in America. And uh, if you're overwhelmed, you don't get anything done. And what this blueprint does provide us is a set of suggested guidelines to follow in starting to solve this problem in America and I think the world. And if we stick with it, I think we can make some tangible progress to the benefit not just of the individual patient, but to society as a whole. So what can a university do uh, you know, about this? And in particular, I'm, I'm interested in about the University of New England. And now in my role as Vice President for Research, I have a unique opportunity in that I can coordinate resources around all the different colleges and all the different disciplines to focus on certain areas that we think are either 
unique uh, opportunities for us as a university and or are very important to society. And chronic pain and neuroscience was one of those. I like this definition of a university. It's the, the modern university of Humboldt is how he envisioned it in the early 1800s. And he talks about this merger of not just the research scholarship, but the education piece together. And there's a recent commentary in Nature that drives this home, that we can't lose sight of the fact that as a university, we are educating students. If we lose sight of that, we lose the very soul of the university. Uh, so I think that's something we've kept in mind as we've built our research capacity uh, with the students. So to give you a little bit of background, though, and, and where we came from and where we're now you know, poised to head into, I want to tell you a little about this uh, University of New England, which you may or may not be familiar with. It's a relatively new university. It was uh, kind of started in 1978, where we had a uh, St. Francis College, which was basically going out of business. It was a small liberal arts college. And they had excess capacity on their campus. And there was this brand new osteopathic medical school that needed a location. And so they, they merged. And they had two things going for them back then in 78. One was a world-class location. It was right on the Atlantic Ocean and the Saka River. You can see that there. Uh, full disclosure, by the way, that's my boat. And uh, I, it's one of the, the, uh, the draws of living on the coast of Maine is that I'm able to get dock access for it. The other thing was that they chose the name University of New England, which at the time was kind of over the top. We were uh, something that we had to grow into, and the president recognized that, though. It gave us more of a regional uh, presence. Now, along the way, we've engaged experts uh, to help us grow research infrastructure. I got there in 2001, and we were doing under a million dollars of total external funding as a university at that time. Um, the summers were ghost towns on that campus. Uh, but I saw potential when I interviewed there, and there was a, a few core group of people that really had a vision. They had gotten the medical school off the ground, they had shored up the undergraduate population, and they had just acquired the Westbrook College of Health Professions up in Portland. So that gave us a, a series of health professional programs where we might be able to accomplish something crazy like interprofessional education. Along the way, we engaged these experts, and Dan was involved with the 2010 uh, report. Um, the 2002 report uh, started it all off, where they took stock of what we had, and they gave us a blueprint. And silly us, we had spent this money on these consultants, and we listened to them, and we did something like 90% of the things they suggested we did do. They said that's unheard of, and we've never had a university actually follow those directions that closely. Uh, it was naive on our part. You know, we said we paid good money for you guys. Uh, you know, we might as well listen to you. And we had the board of trustees involved, the higher administration, and the faculty. So it was a collaborative effort. And I think that's why it gained uh, traction. Uh, just to give you kind of a scope of this, 1978, there was really nothing coming out in terms of publications from the university. And that really tracked pretty low for many, many years. Around 2002 is when we had the AAAS report. And you can kind of see that there's been a significant increase in scholarly productivity as we've really embraced what a university should do, create new knowledge, apply that knowledge to difficult problems, and integrate it back into the education of the students. This kind of shows the growth uh, that parallels it with research dollars extramurally. We're still small, uh, but we're growing in times that are very financially difficult in terms of federal grant money. Um, so that has led us to be able to start to make bigger investments. And again, we've been fortunate to attract um, experts, including through the Pfizer Pain Fellowship Program, where they allow you to bring out visiting scholars and help advise you on these programs. So three who are very big luminaries in the pain field, Howard Fields, Mike Robotham, and Scott Fishman, have all spent days on our campus meeting with a variety of faculty and students and administrators and giving us uh, some you know, semblance of a plan to go forward with this pain program. And that's been incredibly beneficial. We also realized that we were not going to be able to do 20 or 30 different things well. We needed to focus on three or four, and that was the genesis of these centers of excellence. They were founded not in a particular college. They were supposed to span colleges. And that caused some of the deans to be a little upset. And I said, why don't I get a center? And why doesn't you know, this other person get a center? But that defeated the whole purpose. We did not want silos. Silos kill things, and we wanted uh, things that really embraced cross-collaborative projects. So this is now the Neuroscience Center. Um, most of these faculty are full-time faculty at University of New England. There are some uh, adjunct and cross-appointments with other uh, groups in Maine and beyond, 
uh, that help uh, you know, diversify the, the audience. There is philosophers, mathematicians, every health profession is represented in here, so it's not just a group of PhDs studying pain. And I think that is what adds value. We have artists in here, musicians, et cetera. With this came some you know, good news. As we built the program and the credentials, we were able to uh, attract larger uh, you know, external funding grants, including this COBRE grant, which is meant for states like Maine that are typically underfunded with NIH dollars. And so NIH is trying to make uh, you know, a concerted effort to help with these smaller states in terms of growing infrastructure. So the, the point here is that once this was announced, which was August of two years ago, uh, there was a lot of press in, in, the, in the state of Maine, and I was bombarded with a lot of emails and phone calls. And so this is where I'm going to step way out of my comfort zone. I kind of self-realized after about 20 years in the pain field, I had never had a meaningful conversation with a pain patient. That's pretty bad. You know, I write all these grants, and I try to justify these grants by saying how horrible pain is, but I really didn't understand what these people were going through. So one of the first emails I got was a mother who was from Canada. And she had a young daughter. At the time, she was 13, uh, twisted her ankle, and ultimately developed into complex regional pain syndrome. It took 18 months to get a correct diagnosis. And by then, we had missed this opportunity for aggressive interventions that might have put it at bay and might have prevented it from becoming basically permanent. So she's now in her 20s, and uh, she traveled to UNE to take part in her health symposium. It's an amazingly complex case that begs for an interprofessional approach. And I'm not going to highlight all the details of it. We have some of the transcripts and some of the video narratives up on our website. Uh, but a beautiful young woman with a mother and a father who are trying to help her in any way they can, and she's been devastated by this chronic pain. Just a couple snippets that will give you a sense of some of the things that happened. It was dismissed. She was acting out. She was 13 years old. It couldn't have been that bad a pain. She was told to suck it up. Not a very good bedside manner. They went from doctor to doctor. No one believed her because they couldn't see anything. It didn't show up on an x-ray. It didn't show up on an MRI. Uh, the lesions had not developed yet. The change in color didn't show up yet. And another doctor, you know, they had a physical therapist who had said, this might be reflex sympathetic dystrophy. So they went back to a primary care physician who said, I don't believe in those newfangled diagnoses, dismissed it. So they grabbed her leg. She went through the roof in pain. Put this last one in here. You know, we study in animal models chronic pain and hypersensitivity. We talk about this allodynia and you know, the air from an air conditioner going over your skin, setting off terrible, terrible pain. But if you've never experienced it, this really, I think, puts it in some context going up or down an elevator with the pressure changes. That causes excruciating pain for her. When she came to Maine, she was worried about the frost heaves between the airport and the university. She has to have special uh, pillows that she uses in the car. She has to give herself an extra dose of oxycodone preemptively to prevent excruciating pain. You can see the, the swollen, change in color leg the, the lesions that started to develop. So very challenging case that required many different health professionals. And there were some great stories in here where people did rally. Uh, when she had to go get her uh, wisdom teeth out, the dental surgeon listened to her. They admitted her to the hospital in preparation that she might have you know, horrible, horrible after pain. And they got her own linens. They allowed her mom to stay overnight with her in the hospital room. It went uneventfully, which was a great outcome. Uh, but people listened and they adapted. This is a very personal story for me too because both my parents have chronic pain. This is my mom and my uh, son, uh, Joshua. And my mom had 20 years of pain that was precipitated by a uh, fractured hip. We had a Rottweiler that pulled her over, fractured her hip. It was a weird fracture. It was a twist, spiral fracture. They went through a surgery uh, that was probably ill-advised. They, they should have done a different type of surgery. Eventually, they did a second surgery and then a third surgery. But along the time, she was telling them something's not right. She was not able to walk or exercise. She became depressed, anxious, trapped in her own body. Uh, she was worried about addiction to opioids. Uh, her physician would prescribe her nothing stronger than Tylenol and codeine. So a complex, long-term case 
eventually she had a surgeon that listened to her, did exploratory surgery basically, and said, I cannot believe you were even walking. It was so degenerated. But at the time, it didn't show up on MRIs. It didn't show up on x-rays. They didn't listen to her. And she talked to our medical students a couple years ago, uh, 120 strangers, and she took over and talked about patient-controlled analgesia in a way that was just gripping. She said, it gave me control. When I hurt, I pushed the button. I got pain relief. It was in my hands, not the nurse's hands. I didn't have to wait for someone to come see me. That was a huge deal for her. That was right about when they started introducing patient-controlled analgesia. It's my dad bending over. He is now 88, and for the last several years, he's gotten progressively worse pain, uh, which they thought was first associated with his spine, and then they've now narrowed it down. They think the sacroiliac joint. He has gone through so many different procedures. He's tried courses of opioids, titrations with fentanyl patches, uh, he's tried all kinds of uh, physical therapy, uh, ablations. Uh, unfortunately, not any success yet. And I talked to him last night. He's desperate. He is depressed. And it, it's you know, very difficult to be a, you know, a son trying in the pain field you know, to say, you know, what can we do next uh, to try to help this? You can see he's just wincing. They finally got a uh, chair on the stairs so that uh, you know, he can be taken up and down the stairs. Uh, so, I thought about this when I was visiting him over the fall. I took this picture from the outside looking through the window. And this is really, I think, uh, something that we need to recognize, that no matter who we are, whether it's our parent, our spouse, a patient of ours, a student, we're always looking through a window. That could be cloudy. It cannot let enough light in. And you have to kind of open it up and say, well, this is you know, someone who's got a granddaughter. He wants to stay independent. Uh, there's a lot of issues going on here. We need a social worker, maybe. We need a psychiatrist. We need a physical therapist. We need a team that's going to listen to these pain patients. So here's where Dan comes in and why I like working with him and Scott Fishman. He introduced me to the narrative and a book that he co-edited. I always thought the narrative was to write that next grant to get funding. And I could you know, talk about how big a problem it was and you know, on and on and on. And, uh, Really, that's not a narrative. Uh, it might get you the grant, and you might be able to do some good things with that funding. But ultimately, we need to listen to these patients and what they're telling us. Uh, I use this as an example. This is what I'm going to show you is a lot of student-centered uh, work, uh, including some work that Lindsay did when she was an uh, undergraduate with us. Uh, this was a photographer that started to interview some of these pain patients in the community. Pain affects the very young. This is a kid with rheumatoid arthritis. They're not supposed to get rheumatoid arthritis. How do you tell that to an eight-year-old? This is a young lady who's in our physician assistant program. She never wanted to be a physician assistant. She wanted to be a professional dancer. But she was racked with chronic injuries that led to debilitating pain, and she had to hang it up. And that was incredibly emotionally difficult for her because uh, she had worked all her life for one set of goals and achievements. This is Rob Foley, who Lindsay knows quite well. He's a former Navy SEAL. Uh, he reached out to me after the uh, grant was announced, and he talked about uh, basically he was ready to end his own life. Um, it was very scary, and, and I remember vividly when he came to my office to talk. He walked in with a presence. He's about 6'2", broad shoulders. He still exercises to combat the pain that he has. Um, but he then went on and on about how debilitating that pain had become. He's had so many surgeries and slipped discs and herniated discs and tendons blown. Um, his body is ravaged from 20 plus years of military service. He's got post-traumatic stress disorder too. He gets one under control, the other one flares up, the other one's back. And it's this play back and forth. And we think that there's good neurobiological basis for this. They co-vary. He doesn't want to take drugs. He will refuse to take opioids. One of the few things besides exercise that works for him is equine therapy. When he's with horses, he escapes from that pain and that PTSD for some period of time. He has now become reinvigorated with the interactions he's had with us. He's speaking to our health professional students. He is taking uh, up veterans' health and trying to improve uh, transitions for veterans coming home with PTSD and chronic pain uh, in ways that are very proactive. And that's given him, I think, a new lease on life and a much more optimistic outlook. 
This is a lady that um, Lindsay came in contact with. Uh, she had to do a community service project as part of the undergraduate uh, requirements. And she identified this chronic pain support group that was in southern Maine. And Sue Gold is the chapter founder. She had rheumatoid arthritis that I would have thought you diagnose that very simply nowadays. Back when she got it, it was not so simple to diagnose, I guess, because it took years for her to get the correct diagnosis and get effective treatment, which is now under remission, and she's benefited tremendously pharmacologically from these, these treatments. Uh, but at the time, this pain was you know, devouring her life, was enveloping her. She describes this very vividly. This is very poignant for me in that she's got family that's very supportive and understanding of the pain that she's in. However, they don't truly understand it. It took someone who was a homeless man with all kinds of his own troubles. She was getting out of her car, wincing in pain, moving slowly, and this homeless man looked her in the eye, which you know, not a lot of healthcare professionals, especially physicians, look their patients directly in the eye. And he said, I feel sorry, you look like you're in pain. I hope you get better. That was that crystal clear moment for her where it all gelled and said, oh my God, someone else understands my plight and he's probably worse off than I am. I've got to go do something about this. And she formed the chronic pain support group to help others that are dealing with similar uh, conditions. So this is just one example. They just celebrated, I think, their 25th, 20th or 25th anniversary. And we were able to host as UNE with this partnership uh, to bring them back and have them tell their stories of how this chronic pain support group has helped them deal with chronic pain. Very much, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not an artist, I'm not a musician, no musical talent, no artistic talent, but I think I can appreciate uh, beauty. And this is called FIRE. It was American Pain Society did a series of artists who had chronic pain and how they represent their pain. And this one caught my attention. And just on a whim, I emailed uh, the artist. And I said, by any chance, is this you know, uh, painting for sale? It's a very large painting. And she says, well, I have a whole series of them. No one has ever asked me. And it's not my normal work. And she sold me the whole uh, group of canvases for, I think it was like four or $500. Amazing, because it, it's very moving. You can see her spine and the fire. And you know, what happened to her was she had these Either some type of a tumor that kept coming back in the cervical area. Multiple surgeries. During these surgeries, they removed bone. There was nicked nerves. She's got excruciating chronic pain that she'll probably have to deal with the rest of her life. She escapes momentarily when she paints. It takes her away from that reality, that harsh reality. What I found very interesting in her narrative is that she said artists are not very sympathetic to other artists that suffer from mental illness or chronic pain. I would think if anybody was open, it might be the artists, to other artists that suffer from these chronic diseases. Not the case, according to her. There's another artist, uh, Karen Muzak in Texas, who traveled from Texas with you know, a debilitating pain condition to be part of our symposium. And you can see this representation of her back and the electrical, cold, hot, the shroud, the veil over her. Something you cannot describe, I think, very easily in a medical textbook or a grant. So I gotta poll the audience. How many recognize the type of painting on the left? And how many recognize the person on the right? Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. Not too many of my students, undergraduate students, know who Bob Dylan is, unfortunately. And this is Pablo Picasso. I like this one because there's a song called Tangled Up in Blue. And there's a line in there that says that we always did feel the same. We just saw it from a different point of view. It was supposedly influenced by the Cubist movement that he was getting into in the, in the 60s and early 70s. And the Cubist movement took place in the early 1900s when society was changing dramatically. The industrialization, all the new technology that was confronting society. Uh, the world was becoming flat. And there was world wars in brewing Europe. And they were looking at this very complex world and all these angles and these different approaches. This is what I think we have to consider with the chronic pain patient and in probably any chronic neurological disorder. There's many different points of view that we have to consider and work with uh, to, to lead to positive outcomes. So here's where I'll get a little bit of basic science in here and some clinical science. We are, I think, at this next generation of 
technologies that are going to open up the brain in ways that we just could not imagine five years ago. Uh, there are so many new techniques. We can't abandon the old, the tried and true, the patient interview, listening to the patient. But with the genetics and now the modern brain imaging and the spectroscopy that we can look at the biochemical changes going on in discrete brain regions. Uh, one, I think it's going to legitimize the chronic pain condition as a disease. And that's going to help from the patient perspective and the societal perspective, I think. Um, and this is the search for biomarkers. Uh, I'm a basic scientist, and I think there's some, still some intriguing things that we need to pursue as basic scientists that will have translatability to help us treat patients. Um, and this is one example of work I presented at Tufts when I gave my, my pharmacology seminar on something at the time that was pretty new, which was constitutive activity of G-protein coupled receptors and how these opiate antagonists that we lump together might differentiate based on inverse, neutral, or partial agonists. This was followed up recently uh, by Brad Taylor and his group. It was published in Science last fall. He's making the argument that experiencing acute pain can change G-protein coupled receptors and the neurons in semi-permanent fashion. In some ways, that's not surprising. We know addiction is a form of learning and memory and leads to synaptic plasticity, adaptations that occur in the cells, and that changes re, you know, rewiring of the brain. But chronic pain, there's evidence for that too. And he showed um, with rat models and mouse models that this can occur in the mu opiate receptor, which is the target for many of the opiate analgesic drugs. Uh, so that, if that bears true in human populations, early pain experiences can influence much later experiences to painful or sub-painful stimuli. The other thing I've been watching very closely is that chronic pain rewires the brain. There's good human evidence and there's good animal models that support this. This looks like it has a detrimental effect on cognition. So that's something we can study at the basic science level and hopefully translate, and we can look at clinical observations and back translate. I think even more exciting for the University of New England is that we've got someone who studies decision making. And she's done most of her work in the cancer field where you have a serious diagnosis, you've got a lot of treatment options, you as the lay person patient are overwhelmed by all these options, and the physician knows everything, you defer to the physician to make the decision. That is not a shared decision. And even the best physician is not going to understand all of the literature that's out there and all the evidence for and against particular treatments and risks. And if they don't listen to their patient, they're not going to understand what's most meaningful and important to the patient for an outcome. And this is, again, where I think the entire healthcare professional field comes into play here, because they're going to have more contact, build stronger relationships with these patients. And even, you know, we say the, the dentists have a lot of contact, and the dental hygienists. This is opportunities to find something that might be wrong, get to it early rather than later. So uh, Nanan is working with a team on decision making in the chronic pain population, which is very different than the cancer patient population. It gets even more intriguing if you consider that opioids and gabapentinoids affect cognition too. So it's a very special patient population. We've been able to wrap in some of our undergraduate faculty in the psychology department. They study social interactions between freshman uh, roommates. But that exact same set of techniques can be applied to a chronic pain patient and their spouse or significant other. So there's some intriguing ways to now study it. We're not asking this person here, Julie, to become a pain expert, but we'd like her to apply her techniques to study a pain patient in a relationship and see if that impacts how much pain and how much disability they encounter. Jenny is a cognitive psychologist, and she can help us with this project as well. So you know, one of the points I'm making is that I do love to connect people and see these opportunities uh, to then see what happens. Maybe there will be a dead end. Maybe it will turn into something really cool. Togus is our VA hospital. It's the oldest VA system in the country. Um, everybody told me that Togus was impossible to work with. The VA is just all bureaucrats. Well, I got an opportunity to go and give a seminar. I talked to the right people, um, had a good impression, 
it's led to a lot more openings for us. We have now access to their medical record databases. We've got uh, what are called walk appointments without compensation appointments. Uh, we're discussing joint grant applications and it's opening up opportunities for clinical medicine and it's connected with our interprofessional initiative. So we send a lot of our different health professions to this hospital system and in some ways they are much more coordinated in care than other healthcare systems. Another example is reaching out to some of the local hospitals. Mercy Hospital has a pain group that was tasked with stop prescribing all these opioids. Some opioids are fine, too many, that's detrimental, and the indiscriminate is bad. Uh, so they, they went out, they looked at the Mayo Clinic model, they have completely revamped their approach to pain medicine. It's much more integrative. Uh, they have weekly meetings where it's not just a group of physicians getting together. Nurses, physical therapists, social workers, and PhDs and others show up together and talk about a basic science article one week, a public health article the next week. It's very, very uh, interactive, and it's been a lot of fun to work with. So Dan wanted me to talk about our interprofessional education collaborative and, um, and the outreach program that we're doing as well, because we've made some real uh, strides in that. So here's one more slide that Dan told me not to show, because you already know it. On average, most medical schools and other health professional schools do not spend enough time with pain education. We're lucky at the University of New England, for whatever reason, whether it was an osteopathic medical school, a group of uh, health professionals that thought pain was important and had some expertise and confidence in it, we put an awful lot into it. We have over 65 hours dedicated to pain in the medical school curriculum. Uh, we integrate it with the anatomy, we integrate it with the uh, osteopathic manipulative medicine. The interprofessional group has been working and evolving for over 13 years now. Uh, last year, they wanted to do a, a symposium. They do a symposium each year. Brought a 1,000 of our students together into one venue. I think we had something like 75 or 80 small group tables set up. And in general, there was almost all the health professions were represented at each table. It was a pretty amazing thing to try to pull off. We used Paula as the case example. We had some great keynotes. Dave Thomas, who's heading one of the initiatives at NIH, Judy Watt Watson, I think she comes from a nursing background and has changed the way Toronto, University of Toronto, teaches pain education. Kathleen Sluka comes from a PhD in physical therapy background. Uh, Candace Powell does end-of-life hospice care. Uh, so motivational key opinion leaders at morning sessions. And then we had a lot of breakout sessions, many of which were run by students that set up the activity and then looked at assessing it as well. So it was, it was a pretty amazing day. Our IPE efforts, um, we entered the Clarion competition, uh, which I guess is a national competition. And our, our first time, uh, we had an internal competition and sent our best team out. And they took second place in the first time we've ever competed there. And we were competing against some big universities. Uh, so I think you know, it shows that you can, if you believe in it and you work with the students and get them ready for it, they're going to do amazing things. You just facilitate that. Uh, and it takes some you know, talented faculty that want to work across these disciplines uh, to train people uh, to think outside the box. One of the other things I think is next to impossible to do, I don't know how we did it, um, we got the undergraduate curriculum, the bachelor's level pre-professional students, to have a cohesive group of uh, courses that they take to prep them for interprofessional education in the professional schools. Uh, that took a coordination between the professional colleges and the undergraduate college. And we don't know how it's going to do long term, but we're starting to assess it and looking at outcomes. Are these uh, kids that are graduating with the bachelor's degree or entering you know, a 2-4 type program better prepared to do the interprofessional activities in the professional program? And then the big question is when they get out into the clinics, you know, what are our desirable outcomes? This is where we're just kind of starting to assess those things. Um, and again, if you're interested, I can put you in touch with Shelley Cohen Conrad and Chris Hall and others who are doing a lot of other types of training and are getting some uh, significant uh, philanthropy and foundations to help with the interprofessional piece and uh, trying to you know, put some of this online, make it freely available to people. The outreach is another thing that has been really exciting because we have all these basic scientists we like uh, to do neuroscience outreach with the K through 12 school system. Um, 
and we're coming in contact with something like 3,500 students a year in the southern Maine uh, area. We want to ramp it up even further. And I think one of the unique things is that, one, we've partnered with a foundation. Uh, it's a small foundation. It was based on a son who had a traumatic brain injury, survived, had all kinds of disabilities that he overcame. He had amazing rehab, including down here in Boston. I think he was at Spalding. And uh, reassimilated into school, went on to college, but along the way developed epilepsy. So he was dealing with another chronic condition. He was on all kinds of medications that were causing very nasty side effects. Physicians were not listening to him. He ultimately went through a series of tests and decided as an adult to take himself off the medications and only have a rescue medication. He ultimately succumbed to um, a, a grand mal seizure uh, that starved his brain of oxygen. But the family has taken their grief and has worked closely with us to promote brain safety, uh, concussion awareness, helmet use, etc. So this is, I had to put Lindsay's picture in there. Uh, she was part of the outreach program. And our model is grow up and grow out. We don't want to do a one and done thing. We want to build relationships with teachers and school systems and have multiple contacts as the kids grow into middle school and high school. The central theme is brain safety, but we then grow out or branch out and start to engage these kids in higher level STEM disciplines that relate to neuroscience. So we can talk about addiction and chronic pain and some mathematics and physics and biochemistry and the, you know, the higher level uh, high school kids. And they've picked up the challenge. We bring human brains out there. We go into some pretty significant neuroanatomy and neurology with these kids. Uh, Dan alluded to the, you know, that we got an invite down uh, by the White House Office of Science and Technology to kick off Super Neuroscience Saturday. Uh, it was an amazing day where they had uh, area youth come in and we gave them uh, you know, one of our modules on learning and memory. Uh, it was a lot of fun and it gave us some exposure to uh, the Smithsonian, the AAAS, and some policymakers on the value of K-12 through education and the relationships universities and colleges can have with these school systems. How am I doing for time? Okay. So the last one is a little bit of clinical data. Uh, and again, it's a no-brainer. We're, we're over-prescribing uh, medications indiscriminately. And that has led to a crisis on top of the chronic pain crisis. Maine is a state that is very high in terms of consumption of opioids. And there's all kinds of you know, horror stories, too, of people robbing pharmacies and uh, you know, selling uh, uh, drugs and diverting drugs. The thing I'm most concerned about as an opioid pharmacologist is some emerging evidence that chronic opioids may be detrimental uh, to our long-term health. Now that's a balance that you've got to have because chronic pain definitely leads to disability and it may also uh, decrease lifespan, put you at risk for other things. This is a series of studies that came out a few years ago, I think it was out of a Boston group, uh, that retrospectively looked at large data sets, and they wanted to determine uh, if there's any difference between people with chronic pain that were on opioids versus NSAIDs. And there's always limitations of retrospective studies. Uh, they acknowledge that. They use some sophisticated statistics to try to help control some of those confounds. They referred back to some of the Vioxx COX-2 inhibitor uh, debacle, where um, you know, they pushed the dose of these COX-2 inhibitors, there was a cardiovascular risk profile that wasn't necessarily disclosed in time. That led to you know, the backlash with Merck. Um, and you know, basically the increase, um, you know, uh, the decreased the GI bleeds, but increased the cardiovascular events. And so that's shown here. Um, so you've got the um, coxibs, which are selective for cyclooxygenase 2, decreasing the GI bleeds. But there was an increase in the uh, heart attacks and strokes. Now, if you had to guess, where do you think the opioids would fall? For those people who have chronic pain, elderly, and they're getting opioids for their pain. Would it be close to the non-selective NSAIDs? Would it be elevated like the COX-2 inhibitors? Or maybe it would be cardioprotective? How many think a decrease in cardiovascular risk? Everybody's got to vote, by the way. So you think decrease, 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 about the same? as aspirin? How about the same as a COX-2 inhibitor, a little bit of an elevated risk? Look at that. Elevated well above the COX-2 Vioxx that was taken off the market. 
Now again, retrospective, and you got to control for maybe these people were, had more serious pain, they needed the opioids, maybe they were, had other health factors that weren't controlled for. There's other evidence coming out with myocardial infarctions and those who receive opioids and those who don't that are suggesting a cardiovascular risk profile. Who's gonna pay for the prospective study that would definitively find, randomly assign them to the different types of pain control, look at their pain control levels, but then follow them for a number of years. Enormously expensive, no incentive to do it. Very difficult trial to do. But then we're left, look at this. This is composite fractures, elevated with opioids. Other safety events that result in hospitalizations, elevated. All cause mortality, elevated. This could be the tip of the iceberg. It could be an artifact, uh, not controlled retrospective study. But we're not going to know unless someone figures out a way to answer this definitively. So I, I want to give you some final thoughts in closing, and then we, hopefully we can open up to discussion. I love this quote from Jackie Robinson. Um, I was you know, having a successful career as a PhD basic scientist. I got into administration because I like to pull things together, build things. I feel much more... Uh, a meaningful uh, part of my career in this last year and a half, working with these pain patients, learning their stories, working across these disciplines, learning about interprofessional education. So one of the things I challenge you is to get out of your comfort zone. Dan, this is one of Dan's favorite quotes. He may have used this before. This is a famous rabbi who studied the Talmud, uh, undertook uh, an annotation of it that he thought was not going to take very long. It ended up being his career. He said he never would have gotten into it if he had uh, really understood what this undertaking was going to be. Um, so sometimes we have to, and this is the version that Dan gives me. I guess he gave this to the public health commencement group. Um, you know, go in with that youthful enthusiasm. Uh, it's okay to underestimate the amount of work uh, and just get it done and do it collaboratively because you can't do it by yourself. These are two complex problems. We need to work together uh, across the disciplines and across institutions, too. And um, my own personal take on all this, uh, I was taking my kids out for a, uh, the bus stop one fall day, and I was walking back in, and I said, I gotta grab the camera. The sun was reflecting off the wet grass, and I saw these footprints of my uh, middle son, Joshua. And I'm like, you know, my life has become kind of this walk out to this corner, do a 90 degree turn, walk up the driveway, do another 90 degree turn. Where did I lose that? optimism of a kid that jumps over a bush, goes back and forth, uh, you know, across the grass, and, you know, gets there probably quicker than I got there, might have broken some rules, but ultimately also had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, so it's about fun, and I'll leave you with this. I was at the World Series game. Uh, it was one of those things, I, expensive tickets, my wife and I, it's the only time in our lives we're going to be able to do it, let's do it. And we don't regret it. Humanistic, uh, it was electric in that Fenway Park. Uh, that entire game. It was an amazing experience. So thank you. So I'm happy to take questions. I can talk afterwards too. Thank you for that uh, wonderful and far-reaching talk. And uh, we definitely have an interprofessional group here looking around all the wonderful people who come. Are there questions for Dr. Wilski? It's a very unusual, wide-ranging talk. The first question I have is about the last thing you brought up about the possible risk for opioids for older patients, which is very interesting. You know, recommendations right now when you're treating someone for pain, um, for mostly acute pain, I, I would guess some chronic pain as well. For a younger adult, you would, uh, for a young adult, you would start with something like uh, salicylates and acetaminophen. The next step would be NSAIDs, and the last step would be opioids. But for geriatric patients, you would it switches. So you would start with maybe aspirin and Tylenol initially, um, and then go to opioids. And lastly, NSAIDs. There's so many problems for long-term use of NSAIDs. So it's an interesting controversy. Um, and it's an interesting point to bring up. Yeah. I tell the uh, the students that I lecture to. I'm a pharmacologist, and I'd love if one day we don't have to use drugs because all drugs carry you know risks along with their benefits, and it's this balancing act. And each patient, each patient population is. Is different and it becomes a very daunting task uh, as a prescriber you know you, you have to you know, be giving these potential poisons and uh, you know, weigh all those uh, risks and benefits 
Uh, behavioral modification, it's something, again, another area of medicine that I have no experience with. I see the value in it. I think it's undervalued and underutilized. But I also know it's incredibly difficult. I've got a Fitbit on right now. I'm trying to track how much activity I have as a desk job. It's abysmal. So I've been trying to take stairs. I've been trying to you know, lower my weight and caloric intake. Because uh, I don't want to have bad knees and bad back and, and all that. Uh, but it's enormously challenging to change things that are ingrained in our culture and ingrained in our habits. It's learning and memory. Um, so, yeah, you've got to try both. You've got to balance all this and hopefully with a successful outcome. But, again, begs for interprofessional. You need to, to have all of those groups and alternative complementary types of uh, medicine and practice as well. That involved with that, there's a new dental school there as well, right? Yep. So all the colleges have signed on, including the undergraduate college. It's been a battle at times. You know, some people do not want, you know, God forbid we teach a little bit less pharmacology and use a case that stresses into professional education. We have abandoned in the medical school the, the traditional lecture. We do 10, 15 minutes, do a small group activity, present a case, they go, they come back, we do a case conference. Um, we do not have the disciplines anymore. We combine all the biomedical science disciplines into one department for the very reason we don't want the kid to think, I'm getting a pharmacology class now, I can forget about that. Now I'm in biochemistry, now I'm in physiology. It's all blended with themed cases each, each uh, um, you know, week of, of the semester. Uh, and on top of that is the integration with all the other health professions, finding enough time that's meaningful to get them to work as teams on these more challenging chronic cases and hear each other out on how they would approach it and how they can work together to maybe lead to a more successful outcome. Again, it's untested water though. We have to start to think about what are the desirable outcomes of a graduate and of a healthcare system that employs interprofessional approaches versus one that doesn't. Is it gonna save money? Is it gonna have a more successful outcome for the patient? Is it gonna use less um, uh, you know, pharmacological uh, you know, manipulations versus you know, other things. Um, it's exciting, but daunting. Where do you see this going? I find that most of uh, the patients, um, mo most of the patients see primary care physicians, family medicine, and they get 15 minutes of time. Yep. It's so easy to give medications, yep. to give drugs. And yet, pain clinics don't seem to be flourishing. They seem to be disappearing because they aren't supported by third-party payers. Yeah. So I'm curious as to, you know, those clinics give a lot of time to those patients and perhaps are really beneficial. Um, where do you see this whole thing going in the future? Yeah. Again, not as a, as a prescriber, a physician, or a healthcare professional. I'm an outsider looking in that, through that window. I, I think it could go a couple different ways. At, at some point, we are in a crisis. We are, the cost of healthcare delivery in this, you know, in this nation is the highest in the world. The outcomes are you know, not so good. Um, we're, we're at the tipping point, right? So there's gonna have to be a correction. How dramatic a correction it is and how much of it is in reaction rather than proactive is really gonna rely upon leadership in the health professions and leadership in our legislatures. Am I optimistic that they can come together to some kind of consensus? It's, it's gonna be a difficult, and it might get more of a crisis tipping point before it gets better, but it has, to, it has to change. We can do our part as a university in training this next group of students who are gonna be into the residencies, into the clinics. Maybe they're the ones that are gonna change this. Um, it's gonna take some time. It's a lot of inertia to overcome. Uh, but if we start small, and that's what I like about Maine, is that uh, we're a rural state, large geographical area. We have these health pockets that we can maybe do some of these interventions. TOGUS and some of these other small healthcare systems have been very open to having us have a group of students from these different professional programs. And they're giving us feedback saying that they love the fact that they've already been trained to communicate and to work together. They don't have to be in the same room at the same time with the patient, that's impossible. But they have to understand what each profession can provide, do the referrals when needed, 
the primary care physicians playing this very important role of the quarterback. Uh, but they have to understand all the different players on their team and how to utilize them effectively. I'd just like to comment from my discipline of occupational therapy. Many of the patients that you described there, either the artist or the veteran who spent time with horses or the woman who turned her pain into a, a support group to help others, the, the, the occupation that they engaged in gave them some respite from the pain. And um, it's, it's important to me for people to understand that, that engaging in activity isn't, isn't only the goal, it's the treatment modality too. And as, uh, this is also hard to get hard science around. In occupational therapy, we have literature on it, but it's, it's um, based on interviews with patients and things like that. I think there's some interesting possibilities in the literature that's being done now on distraction. A lot of it's being done in, in pediatric field, but, but um, these functional MRIs allow us to see that when you do a stroop task, as simple as that is, the pain matrix doesn't light up as much in the brain. Well, it says to me, my goodness, if, if a stroop task can distract you from pain, then reading a story to a grandchild must really make a difference, yeah. you know, so it's my little plug for occupation. I, I smile because we incorporate the Stroop test in our K through 12 outreach program to demonstrate you know, learning and memory and, and uh, reaction times and you know, how you get better at things. But I, I agree completely that the neuroplasticity that occurs when we engage in just about anything can usually be beneficial. And there's some good literature in the rehab you know, field from stroke and, and other you know, major neurological damage uh, that you've got to engage people more aggressively you know, soon after the injury and, and work them up, challenge them. Uh, don't let them get discouraged, I and mean, that's the, you know, the, the barrier is, is this going to cause more pain, is, you know, uh, how much time and effort do I have to put in it, but you need, just like athletes, you need a coach that's going to stick with you and get the most out of, uh, and, and tailor it to you, right? Some people might be better candidates for art therapy, music therapy, um, you know, equine therapy, whatever it is, exercise, uh, so it's exciting, and I think that's, the value of all of these health professions together uh, give us lots of different options. I'll put a plug in too. Research is not just the realm of a medical school or a dental school. Our Westbrook College of Health Professions traditionally did not do a lot of scholarship. I, I think it was because it just wasn't expected and there was a barrier there. Well, if I've never done it before and I don't have any mentors, how is it going to move forward? So we've been kind of introducing things with like decision-making sciences. We're not ready to jump into large-scale clinical trials, but we can ask some fairly sophisticated questions on decision-making in particular patient populations and see if we can improve you know, outcomes you know, for, for the patient and the provider. So, and that's involving all of our you know, occupational therapy, social work, and you know, physical therapy groups. That'll be here for a little bit. I wanted to thank everybody for staying till the end and uh, great questions from our graduates, uh, which we only expect, and great observations. And uh, especially a round of applause for Ed for coming down and, <laughs> and really pioneering what I think is not just something in the future, but it's the wave of the present. He's been a good mentor too. Thank you, Dan.